Now, um, I'm going to begin with yourself, His Excellency, um, Martin. Your personal relationship with Dr. Tedros, give us an insight in terms of when um, a gentleman of his caliber takes to a stage and I feel like almost as a bit of a school teacher, giving us a bit of a lesson, telling us off. We have neglected, we have forgotten the painful lessons. Tell us something about the motivation and passion behind those words because you know him personally. Yeah, well, I think uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Tedros says resonates very well with me, not because both of us come from Africa, but because uh, I think we share a common vision for promoting uh, global health. And uh, as you ask me this question, uh, I go back to that, the early days of his uh, mandate when he paid me a courtesy visit. And uh, he was very anxious to capture the attention of uh, the global parliamentary community in support of better health outcomes. And that's what uh, uh, binds me to him. And what he says is topical because I witnessed firsthand how the COVID pandemic uh, caught us all napping. And uh, I think that we came out of this uh, reinforcing our conviction that we should never let this happen again. Humanity, the global community, should not be again caught wanting in response to a global health crisis of the proportions that uh, uh, the COVID pandemic took on. So I, I share uh, his uh, passion for making this happen. And that is why I am very pleased to mobilize the global parliamentary community that I lead uh, to support the uh, creation of a framework that would allow us to take collective responsibility for managing uh, crises as they arise in the world today. And you speak very eloquently, um, Your Excellency, about the need for the global health security and it also being on the same two sides of a coin to universal health coverage. So these two things are at the heart of the mission. Yes, correct. I think that uh, uh, when uh, Dr. Tedros paid me that visit, I asked him, so what's your ask of the parliamentary community? And he said that he wanted universal health coverage, he wanted global health security, because to him, they are two sides of the same coin. And that is what has driven our collaboration with the World Health Organization. How can we ensure that there is equity, as Seth was saying, in uh, uh, health access to health across the globe, that no one is left behind? And we believe that uh, universal health coverage can help do that. And now, when you look at the global health <coughs> security agenda, that is where we're coming from when we're talking about the need for a pandemic accord. We need to ensure that the global community is prepared to handle any health crisis. Because I, like Dr. Dr. Tedros, I believe that it's only a matter of time before we're having to deal with, a, with another global pandemic. So as you say, a matter of time and there's a need for a pandemic accord, very powerfully put. So thank you very much for that, Your Excellency. Um, now, I'm sure we do not want to cast our minds back to the pandemic. We will have a mental block with our experiences at that time. But unfortunately, our uh, prestigious panelists, you have the task of doing this, of examining in fine detail how the pandemic was handled and the lessons that can be learned going ahead. Um, Your Excellency Minister Peggy, I'm going to bring you in now for that. Give us an insight in terms of the journey that Seychelles was on during the pandemic and what was learnt in the country. Thank you very much. Um, a small country like Seychelles, a small island state in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, we feel like that, like many other countries, we, the effect of COVID-19 was really devastating. Devastating on different fronts. Uh, one, directly affecting health of our people. We had many people were uh, affected, but we also had uh, quite a high level of mortality. As a small uh, island state, we felt that uh, 
I, I guess the COVID time brought home the, real, the issue of really isolation. Isolation when all borders were closed, where you couldn't get things in, you couldn't get supplies in, supply chain you know, was cut, was affected, and that uh, led to a number of issues for us, such as not being able to respond to the kind of uh, response that the country would have wanted to. We also found that um, on the international scene that uh, there was this um, weakness in terms of uh, international collaboration, co uh, cooperation. Uh, we were having uh, different, uh, uh, you know, at times conflicting advice and conflicting knowledge on uh, how to handle what appropriate measures to take to, uh, in our response. And we felt that these were affecting, or affected the way we would have reacted to the, um, to the response of COVID-19. At the same time, I must say that there, you know, there was international support. We were very grateful to the partners who reached out in different ways to assist us with supplies, to assist us with advice, with uh, knowledge, even if this, in a way, was not always even uh, the sharing of knowledge across the, uh, globally, but we did have countries who, who stepped up and helped. And we were very lucky to be able to start our um, immunization uh, vaccination campaign right at the start of January 2021. And this was very much important for us because uh, we needed to have a response that would permit us to open our borders. Because for us it was COVID, okay, direct cause of COVID was hitting our people uh, health-wise, but it was also affecting us economically, drastically, because we, our two industries, fisheries and tourism, all relied on this international movement of people. And therefore, these were you know, uh, really affected. And being able to open our borders in March 2021 uh, went a long way <clears throat> in us being able to respond to the COVID pandemic. And uh, I guess uh, lessons learned for us is really to be ready, uh, to have a certain level of preparedness that would help to bring about a response which would be in line, uh, targeted, and uh, able to handle uh, the health concerns of people, but as well as maintaining the livelihood. I feel that these were lessons for us which were real, and, uh, and the preparation, as you know, would uh, depend on different things, the infrastructure, the public health concerns, uh, the human resources, which affected our response in a number of ways, and the equipment and all uh, that was needed to provide a, a comprehensive, effective response. Thank, Thank you so much, um, Your Excellency Minister Peggy, for that um, example of how Seychelles handled the pandemic and also the lessons that have been learned. And as you illuminate there, it's a holistic approach. It's the infrastructure on the ground, but also an international coordinated response is needed, as His Excellency Martin called it, a pandemic accord, which perhaps is a softer, gentler way. I know we're talking about an international legal framework. I'm going to bring in Dr. Jawood and also Ambassador Habib at this moment. Let's now make the case for this international legal framework. Um, let's bring our audience up to speed on the, on the journey it's been on, this particular agreement, since 2022. And, um, you know, if we can also kind of identify some of the obstacles um, that you almost kind of have a foresight in terms of what could be the main challenges uh, ahead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amandip. Well, if we talk about the current setting of international response on the uh, diseases, we have actually two tracks of uh, negotiation on the uh, agreements uh, treaty or accord. First of all is the international negotiating body, INB process, uh, that in, most, uh, in more popular term we call it as pandemic treaty or pandemic accord negotiation. 
On my side, uh, we are on the second track, uh, that is the uh, negotiation on the International Health Regulation, HR 2005. Well, if you look at to the, uh, the uh, IHR, what we have is a 2005 IHR agreement. It is actually an agreement, an umbrella, an international binding instrument for the international society to work together to detect response and also to handle what if there is a case of pandemic disease globally. And to forgive me, uh, from an outsider's perspective, are these two groups that are working in parallel? That's, that's a very good and critical uh, question. Learning from the COVID-19 pandemic situation, of course, we need to work together with these two groups. I mean, we do it parallel, and we do some joint meeting together. We consult each other, and to make sure that these two tracks is in the interdependent, and mutually strengthen as well as complementary to each other. We, we need to make sure that uh, the ideal, the goals of the two negotiation are on track and are the same purpose that is to strengthen global society, global uh, community to respond if there is international diseases spreading all around the world. Thank you, and it's really um, interesting for us to understand the mechanisms in play here and also the working groups behind the scenes because on the outside it can feel like it's an, it's an obvious answer, the pandemic occurred. Why isn't there an obvious solution that we can take from the shelf and deliver? Dr. Jawood, of course, with your expertise, if I can ask you to unpack that. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I think it was said before by Her Excellency that uh, countries not, were not prepared. But uh, let me say that no single country was prepared to the scale of health crisis. It's not something that impacted few countries, every country, and no one was prepared, including countries with mature health system. They struggled and their health system collapsed after a few hundreds of cases. This is why <clears throat> for a crisis that impacted every individual, every community and every country, we need to, to have a global uh, solution. Global solution based on two pillars. The first one is each country should prepare, be prepared to deal with epidemics out, outbreaks, but also with bigger skills of <coughs> epidemics, which is pandemics. And also we need to establish mechanism, global mechanism, to bring countries to collaborate together mm -hmm. when a crisis happens. Mm -hmm. WHO with partners established some mechanisms during the COVID, and one of them is the ACT A, uh, COVAX, and others. But it was very difficult to fix the aircraft while flying. We need to now, during the, the peace time, to establish this mechanism to maintain them and also to activate them when something hits. And this is the core uh, spirit of the agreement that is now under discussions, especially that this uh, accord, this agreement, aim what was a big problem in the COVID equity. Access to vaccines, access to diagnostic is a key issue, but access alone is not enough. We need a timely access. When a vaccine is somewhere, it should be everywhere. And this is what this negotiation now are aiming for. Member states decided to have this two-track negotiation. One, to establish new agreement that mainly solve the problem of equity in responding to health crisis crisis and also amend the IHR. And member states were very precise. They don't want to revive the IHR. They want only to amend it because the IHR is wonderful too that mm -hmm. help us last 70 years to deal with surveillance alert and alerting the world on, key, on uh, health crisis. And the, these are two trucks, as Ambassador Habib said, that are complementary. They are two wings of the same bird and they need to go parallel to achieve the global goal of uh, preparedness and response to health crisis. I appreciate you both gentlemen um, really kind of setting the scene for us there and for yourself, Dr. Jawood, that powerful analogy. As you say, you can't repair the aircraft while it's in the air. You describe the two working groups as two wings to the same bird. And I think that we can go with that analogy because we want to soar high and we want to fly high with our solutions. <laughs> but also, as you say, uh, it does need to be a universality um, of care, of preparedness. 
Um, you're right to emphasize that the pandemic did catch everybody uh, unawares, even though Dr. Tedros had on this stage at the World Government Summit predicted it. Now, not of its nature, not of its scale. Now that is forgiveness for the past. We can't possibly forgive future mistakes, so hence why we have you all in front of us to learn from. Now, Your Excellency Martin, I'm going to bring you in at this point. In my research, it's very intriguing to look at a timeline like this, which begins in June 2022 and accelerates towards the very imminent deadline of May 2024. Let's look at the realistic approach of reaching that deadline and what needs to be done in order to reach that deadline. Uh, thank you very much. I think that uh, uh, there is an emergency here. We need to respond uh, in like fashion to an emergency and that is why people may think that the timelines are very short. We, we don't know when the next pandemic is going to happen. It could be tomorrow. And uh, what would we do? So I can uh, make a case for the tight uh, timelines. And I think that what is important is that uh, uh, those who are negotiating the treaty, uh, WHO being the overall health body in the world, should make sure that there are ongoing consultations the, between, or with all the stakeholders. And I, I like very much what uh, the uh, president of the World Medical Association was saying a moment ago, that we need to uh, make a distinction between healthcare and health. Healthcare is for health practitioners' right to do, but health is a collective responsibility. And that is why I would like to see uh, everybody being brought on board, that all views are uh, heard when it, is com it comes to fashioning the pandemic accord. Uh, I come from the parliamentary community and many people may ask why I am involved in this. Uh, if we can imagine the relationship between government and parliaments at the national level where government initiates legislation and parliament scrutinizes and adopts it or uh, amends it. This is what we want to see at the international stage where the voices of the people can be heard through their representatives, parliamentarians. And in international law, it is not for parliaments to conclude treaties. It is for governments to do this. But government negotiators are well advised to be informed by the views of the people as articulated by uh, their representatives, members of parliament. And I think it is important because when uh, I believe we're going to have an accord, maybe not in May, being pessimistic, but when we have that accord, the first port of call when you go back home is parliaments for ratification and domestication into national legislative frameworks for implementation. It is for them to provide the resources that are required to implement the accord. And so I think it is better to hold that discussion at the global level to make sure that parliamentarians are uh, part of the conversation to create an alliance that will uh, uh, roll out when we go back home to the various countries to ensure the success of this uh, treaty. I'm sorry, I have been very lengthy in my, no, no, my no, explanation here, but I think it's, it, is, yes. it is very important that all hands are on deck at this particular stage because we are dealing with something, I mean, uh, uh, pandemic, that has the potential to wreak havoc in the world as we've seen with uh, the uh, uh, COVID pandemic. We appreciate you giving us that in-depth analysis because it allows us to also have an insight in terms of what is happening behind the scenes and negotiations. I'm going to come back to the timeline and exactly what we need to accelerate the timeline. But if I can bring in um, Her Excellency Minister Peggy again, um, His Excellency Martin said we are speaking to the member countries, the parliamentary representatives for the people. So as a representative for the people of Seychelles, what do you want to ensure is in this international legal framework? Uh, I think when we look at um, the lessons COVID has taught us, we have uh, globally a common understanding of the uh, level of preparedness we had 
the sufferings, the impact it had on our country at all levels. And uh, therefore, as a country and as the world, we cannot uh, allow to um, put away these, uh, these experiences without tackling uh, them straight on. Uh, we see that a pandemic agreement has been proposed by WHO. WHO is, has been created or was created for a reason, to safeguard the health of the peoples of the world. It is our organization, we created it, and uh, when we look at timeline, I understand the timeline was not as long as it's now even for this. But we all have, you know, uh, we've been guided that there is the need to have such an accord or such an instrument, an instrument which would help to bring about greater global solidarity, mm -hmm. an instrument which would help countries be, be better prepared to prevent, to protect, and you know, uh, to respond in a timely, appropriate manner. And this is what all countries want. And all countries would share with the different stakeholders at home. As uh, His Excellency uh, Professor Martin has said, we need to also cultivate the, the, uh, the field, the land, so that whenever, when we have this accord, that when we go back to our country, the ratification process, the domestication process would not take long so that we could really uh, act before the next pandemic, you know, eat us if it should come. But as a, con as a, I don't think we have a choice. I don't think we have a choice in terms of not addressing the issue by looking at the best way. And if it is being suggested that the, an international uh, binding agreement <coughs> is going to provide us with all of uh, all that is needed, I think, as uh, member, as parties, we should be looking at it really uh, with uh, all the uh, information that we have to make us come to a decision that will safeguard the health of our our people and the population to come. We cannot go by. Uh, looking at working in, in, you know, as individual countries, as individual regions, we've got to address it globally. And in looking at the, at the accord, I think it's there to provide assistance, to provide a way forward for all countries. And it's not taking anything from us, but it's empowering us to be able to come up with a more appropriate response at national, regional, and global level. Um, Minister Peggy, we really appreciate you giving us that very powerful example from the people of the Seychelles. And of course, on our panel, you are a representative who speaks for the people in general, in the universal uh, application there across the world. Now, Dr. Jawood, um, Minister Peggy seamlessly allows us to address that skepticism, which is in the air. Dr. Tedros spoke about it here on day one the criticism of this framework. Minister Peggy said it doesn't take power away from us, but let's face that head on. What is the criticism and is there any truth in it? Definitely there is no truth, truth in it because member states who are negotiating, countries are negotiating and uh, Her Excellency expressed what countries would like through this negotiation. So the criticism is that the sovereign right of nations yeah, exactly. could be superseded and by this agreement, but you're saying categorically that is not the case. No, this is not the case because countries are, as a sovereign, a sovereign nations, they are discussing how to collaborate together. WHO is not even party of this negotiation. We are only facilitating this negotiation. Mm -hmm. And the only one who are going to decide what is, will be in this accord is member states, is countries, as the sovereign nation, nations. Let me be very clear. There is no such uh, rumors that have now spread about giving sovereignty to WHO. This is not true because countries will never give that to WHO. Second, our constitution doesn't allow 
the WHO to take this power. We are only an advisory body to countries for their, uh, for their decisions, taking consideration their national laws and regulations. And this is why the, the beauty of this negotiation. Country coming together to negotiate what they want to do together to support each other and also to establish global framework to prevent and, and respond to future pandemics. About the timing, I think we are very optimistic because we saw different negotiation where agreements are reached at the last minute and we are still very, very hopeful that we reach the deadline of May 24, especially that countries agree on the principles. All countries who are negotiating agree that equity, for example, should be at the center of the accord. They still discuss how to implement equity but there is no disagreement that equity should not be and the and, accord. And, and this is what uh, uh, keeps us very, very helpful. Just to give you a, an example where when countries want to come together to decide, WHO Constitution, which is a wonderful legal framework, was written, discussed, and approved in six months. Not two years, six months. And those who, are, who approved the WHO Constitution, I believe that their, their uh, grandsons can do it in, in the next coming two months. I like your air of optimism and taking inspiration from the pioneers, and we can certainly champion that. Um, Ambassador Habib, if I can bring you in on those dual points, the criticism, so we can just really kind of um, address it face on, and also what could accelerate the timeline, what is needed behind the scenes. Yeah, well, uh, the negotiation at the WHO context is more or less similar with the other multilateral negotiations, uh, what we know, uh, for, for example, at the UN, where all the parties, the member states, has sovereign rights, sovereign vote to express their voices, to deliver or to extend their interest on that negotiation. That is also uh, happens uh, during the negotiation day at SAR, for example. The criticism that uh, this is uh, a new agreement or new regulation for the health, uh, public health uh, uh, agreement that probably uh, some entity will be more authoritative compared to the member states is not, I think, valid and uh, has a strong argument. What we do is that representative from 196 countries is in the room. They have their own right, sovereign right, to say anything on this process. Exactly that uh, Dr. Jawad has said that WSO is facilitating this negotiation. That's why uh, if we look at to the negotiation, uh, the uh, situation is very optimistic, even though it's intense and also heated sometimes, but Again, I can make sure that this is an intergovernmental negotiation represented by the representative of member states. On how we can deal with this, probably disinformation, misinformation, I think uh, the good things uh, from the multilateral negotiation is that uh, we can share through uh, you know, uh, facilitated interviews, for example, uh, frequently asked questions, uh, publication, and everything. But again, uh, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, is the principle of negotiation. So we don't want to make some intervention by having negotiation, by opening everything into the public without an agreement on the whole context, all the whole text of the negotiation. But I believe that uh, this is uninclusive, this is represented by everyone, so we want to make sure that this new amendment can be making uh, the IHR more precise and clarity, and the global society can be more equipped whenever the pandemic, uh, international pandemic is occurring. Ambassador Habib, we really appreciate your insight there, and it certainly sounds like a, a case that we would all back. Um, the adversary was given uh, very powerfully on a country level, but also an intergovernment level, interparliamentary level. Um, the nature of the agreement, is there general consensus? Because I guess the question would be, if we still have not reached an agreement, on what basis have we not? We've made the very powerful case, as Minister Peggy said, there is no choice. There is no choice. Why is there no consensus already? 
could you elaborate and Dr. Jawood, I'll bring you in on this point as well? Well, uh, this is a negotiation that everyone is thinking about having a consensus, uh, meaning that uh, the interest, uh, the concern of the uh, member state can also be reflected into the text. What important is with uh, the, um, uh, the new amendment is that I, th I think uh, there are three uh, issues. First is the assurance that the principle of equity is there, meaning that everyone uh, has an access and ability uh, to detect, uh, to counter surveillance, to surveillance, and also to have an access to vaccine and medical equipment, for example. And second one is uh, the capacity. Uh, this is also about uh, the access for technology, transfer of technology, uh, the uh, medicals, uh, the pharmacy and everything is in the country or at least they have an access uh, to get the vaccines and medical equipment. The third one is the governance. Uh, we need to make sure that who is doing what in terms of pandemic, meaning that uh, learning from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we don't want to see any chaotic situation whenever the pandemic coming. And uh, we want to make sure that there is a one button, one push button uh, mechanism or machinery is there and everyone uh, can also uh, be prepared uh, with the pandemic. And I would like also to highlight again one uh, important key words uh, during the pandemic that we want to make sure that nothing is safe until everyone is. So this is the idea of having a new amendment of the HR, also to the uh, INB, the pandemic treaty, uh, which uh, of course uh, we need also to grasp the momentum of the optimistic and the constructive engagement of everyone in the room uh, for the negotiation of the text. We really explain you explaining to us all here that actually key to the consensus is that equity, the access and governance. Dr. Jawood, if I can bring you in and then His Excellency Martin on these points, just how, you know, we have a very powerful platform here. How can we ensure the agreement is reached, the consensus on these points? Yeah, I think uh, when, the when the countries and member state of WHO decided to establish the two negotiation processes, they agreed that any outcome should be by consensus. Mm -hmm. And this is how the WHO works. So WHO always work under consensus. Reaching consensus may take time, but uh, uh, consensus make the agreement strong. And when we go to the ratification phase, then we'll have more countries adopting the, 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 the agreement. For example, the FCTC, Tobacco Control Convention, now we have 182 parties. We have only 12 countries on member WHO are not parties, which is very powerful uh, setup. And uh, just maybe, if you allow me, we'll come back to something that uh, Martin Chungong said, which is completely true. The global negotiations are, are very important now to reach consensus by May 24. But uh, sec the second, the next step, which is the ratification at country level, is, is equally, equally or not even more important because during the ratification, uh, the countries will create a national discussion and exchange about the idea and also about what is in the idea or in terms of preparedness, in terms of readiness, in terms of uh, uh, main, making sure that we can face the next pandemic. And this, is, this step is extremely important to mobilize not only government, but government, civil society, and communities mm -hmm. where we show in the COVID the role of communities, how much important. Mm -hmm. And then uh, consensus is good because it makes the, even the agreement stronger and more implementable that if we vote and after vote, some countries were not adhered because they don't agree, uh, because they were voted no on the agreement. This is why consensus, for our, you know, our opinion, is extremely important. Dr. Jawood, I think you make a very important point there about underlining consensus, and you brought in the points that His Excellency Martin brought in earlier. So this is a seamless moment, Your Excellency. You've been listening in to your colleagues here, your esteemed colleagues, speaking about the role of consensus. And of course, you are the general of the Interparliamentary Union. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, we need uh, broad support for a legally binding instrument at the national, international level 
to allow us to take collective responsibility for uh, protecting ourselves from uh, crises such as the one we have experienced in the past. I think that there is a certain level of accountability that we need to put in place. And that accountability uh, also uh, ha is dependent on how successful we are in addressing the concerns that have been raised uh, internationally. Uh, there are doubts, uh, some of them not founded. I, I agree with uh, Dr. Majou that uh, uh, I think we can liken this to fake news. People will spread panic when there should be no panic. And so I, uh, I, I, I see the way forward uh, having two tracks. One, continuing with the negotiating process to achieve as much of a consensus as possible, but also doing an information campaign to dispel those concerns that have been uh, uh, raised. If you don't do that, at the national level, we're going to meet those same people who are uh, spreading those doubts now. So it is important, and I really appreciate the collaboration between the Interparliamentary Union and the World Health Organization in explaining to the legislators, parliamentarians, what we are talking about, uh, because it, this is the moment that you recruit your allies for a pandemic uh, accord. And they will go back home, and they will be your champions when it comes to ratification, as I said. And so it is important that we have that campaign ongoing. And uh, uh, I, as we speak, uh, we are inviting Dr. Tedros to come to our next General Assembly next month mm. to explain to the global parliamentary community uh, the pros and cons of uh, the <laughs> treaty and uh, recruit more members and more supporters for the accord. I think this is very crucial. Otherwise, we will have an accord that does not have buy-in from the cross-section of uh, the global community. I think, and uh, you're absolutely right, addressing the pros and cons, uh, addressing the misinformation is so vital. And I think that's why panel discussions like this here at the World Government Summit are so crucial to just face the critics and actually address it with the truth. So we appreciate you all taking the time out to do that with us today. I'm going to come back to you, um, Minister Peggy, in just a moment. But Dr. Seth Berkeley, of course, our prestigious speaker on the first panel, with your insight. If I can ask my colleagues to maybe get a mic to you, perhaps there might be a point that you want to add, having listened to our wonderful, uh, illustrious colleagues here um, on the topic area. So if I can ask a room manager, someone who is part of our team, to get us a mic to Dr. Seth. <laughs> Um, Dr. Pazani for the team. Oh, you can, or you can speak out loud. It's just for the recording. No, I, I, I think this is a really fabulous panel. And I just want to say, unfortunately, there will always be some bit of panic when a pandemic occurs. Mm -hmm. And there is never going to be absolute equity. Because the first day a new countermeasure comes off the line, it will be just a one moment, Dr. Seth. But I think the critical issue is that we move towards a system that is better prepared, mm -hmm. that systematically is able to assure equity and particular transparency in what happened. So the problems we had was one, we didn't have money ahead of time. This is very important to go ahead and put orders for poor countries in addition to the scramble that rich countries had for interventions. Um, but the second part of this was to make sure when companies were able to produce, for example, vaccines in 327 days, the fastest in history, we didn't know where those orders were going. And having that ability to say transparently, okay, we're sending some to this country or to that country, and that has to happen, and maybe the country that it's in, but then to make sure that they are being transparent on how they're supplying the rest of the world. And this is one of the reasons that the world is also working on expanding the number of production sites around the world, but that's not enough because you also have to make sure you have technology transfer that is appropriate to those sites. So all of these pieces need to be put in place. Consensus is critical from the global community to do this. And the last thing I'd say is there was an obsession last time about intellectual property. 
And you know, that was irrelevant at that moment in time because this is about know-how and transfer. And we saw that because there was a TRIPS waiver done under great pressure mm -hmm. and it didn't lead to any more access. So learning these lessons is critical. If you don't want to repeat history, you have to learn from history. Thank you so much, Dr. Seth. I feel a round of applause. I put him on the spot there, so there's a round of applause <laughs> to Dr. Seth for <laughs> your contribution. I think this is what makes these panel discussions so strong, because it is a holistic approach. We have experts from all fields uniting to reach a common goal. Um, Dr. George, if I may bring you in. No, just to, uh, to reassure the audience that uh, all these issues that were raised are under negotiation now. Uh, for those who are familiar with uh, uh, what we call the negotiation text, you can find all those elements. Those elements. There is provision about prevention, about preparedness and readiness, how to review the preparedness. There is provision on, on uh, access and benefit sharing, provision on uh, uh, transfer technology and know-how, provision on financing, capacity building. I think in their wisdom, the countries, they took lesson, lesson from the COVID and look what doesn't work to fix it now to be better uh, working in, in the next pandemic because Tedro said in the day one we will have a pandemic. We can prevent many of them, but pandemic is n is normal things that come. But uh, the issue is when uh, this pandemic will come, and we need to be prepared for the next one. We cannot afford not to be prepared for the next one. Absolutely, in echoing uh, Minister Peggy's word, the. There is really no choice. Ambassador Habib, I saw that you were patiently waiting. You wanted to come in on this point as well. Well, um, yeah, I agree totally with uh, the need for having a clarity and precision during pandemic. Um, uh, this is why we have a very heated debate, for example, on uh, the financing. Who will support the fund uh, for dealing this, uh, with this uh, pandemic, for example? Who's doing what? What entities in one country that is really dealing with the issue? Learning from the pandemic, we have seen uh, that in one country, for example, we have probably 100 entities that is dealing with uh, the uh, pandemic. Immigration, custom, health ministry, the police, for example, everything. And this is, uh, because this is an emergency situation, we don't have any standardized mechanisms. This is actually what uh, we are talking about also with uh, the process. We want to make sure that there is a clarity, there is a collaboration, and with having uh, some frequency on dealing with this issue from one country to the other. So uh, again, uh, I agree, clarity and precision. Uh, it is important, uh, that's why we uh, agree that uh, the HR is uh, good enough, but not sufficient enough uh, for uh, dealing with the future pandemic. Fantastic, and I think you're absolutely right to address those question marks in the air. One key thing that you mentioned there that we haven't had a chance to explore is financing, who is doing what, so that's really crucial. We've only got two minutes on the clock. I'm gonna allow you all to have a quick shot at a call to action. We began with Dr. Tedros's big call to action, but if there was one particular goal that you wanted to advocate in order to reach this consensus, uh, this agreement. Um, if I can start with Dr. Jawood yourself and come through our panel. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, I will just repeat what Chedros called for the fixed day. We need an agreement by May 24. If we don't have it, uh, I think the, glo the, glo the, the globe will not be prepared and no country will be prepared. We need also an amended IHR, but uh, mm. I think uh, the, the, the whole challenge is to make this IHR better because IHR served the community, the, the global community last 17 years, and we need to make it better. But we strongly believe that we need to be prepared now to face the pandemic. If we are not, we will just uh, not change the, the status quo and what's happening in COVID-19. So we need to be ready to face the pandemic. Ambassador Habib. Well, uh, pretty much more or less the same, uh, that uh, we are working hard. All the member uh, states, uh, the WHO, working together for those two uh, process of negotiation, INB and HR. And we want to make sure that in May 2024, we have two instruments that is strengthen more uh, the ability and capacity of the global society uh, to respond, to detect, uh, and to prevent uh, for the future pandemic. It's reassuring to know that you're working very hard with your colleagues, Ambassador Habib. Minister Peggy. Um, 
I think we all have a collective responsibility to make the world a better and safer place. Uh, from my perspective, I believe that uh, having a, a pandemic agreement, just such as the one being proposed, will contribute greatly to that end. And uh, you know, I do not believe that we can afford not to deliver on this. And as it's been said, time is not in our favor, mm. so let's act now. Fantastic, thank you very much. And Your Excellency Martin. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that a pandemic accord, uh, a legally binding uh, framework for addressing the challenges of a pandemic, is no longer an option. It is mandatory. Mm. And this is because mm. pandemics don't have a national passport. They don't ask you for your permission to happen. They happen. And when they attack you, you have to fight back. And fighting back can only be effective if together we fight back according to a coherent, coordinated framework, which the uh, accord and the amended IHR would provide. So as a representative of the parliamentary community, I would like to throw my weight behind these efforts to build a framework that is binding on all of us, that for which we all will be accountable for the health of the global community. Distinguished guests, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking our esteemed panelists for taking the time out of their busy schedules to really give us a powerful insight into this agreement that we all are wholeheartedly in support of. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.